for the number. Hi, welcome to uh, the first of two June Open NYC meetings. Today we're lucky to have Ohad, Dominic, and Justin, who came in from Israel, Britain, and North Carolina to give talks. Um, and we're going to hear about Foreman, Patello, how they integrate with uh, Puppet Chef ecosystem, and um, just any questions you have, they are the guys developing the software. So, a um, couple quick notes. Uh, just turn off your ringers. Um, we have some uh, Velocity swag that O'Reilly was kind enough to send over. There's like some discount book coupons and some like little booklets and stickers, things like that. We're also, at the end of the talk, we're going to be giving away some t-shirts, some pens, and some books. Um, we can go over them. We have about the way we do it is the speakers are going to come up with trivia questions, and whoever gets called on and answers it right gets first pick, you and we'll go through until we have numbers right before nobody wants any of this right. Um, our next meeting is on the 18th. It's an intro to Puppet Talk. You can find us on Meetup. Um, also, I want to thank uh, the ladders for kind of just pulling together really quickly and. Make allowing this meeting to happen on very short notice. And with that, go ahead, Levy. Right ahead. Thank you. Right, so awesome being here. Thanks to the for hosting us and everyone to making that happen. We talked like on Sunday night, like I'm in New York, and then, you know, somehow all of this happened. So great. Uh, so before we start, how many got, this is a puppet group, right? Are there anyone here, is, everyone here is a puppet user, basically? Like, or where do we stand? Or, is there anyone here who is considering himself a puppet user? All right, cool. Jeff users? All right. And foreign users? All right, wonderful. Okay, so we'll go over a bit what is foreman, but uh, in any point in time, feel free to ask any questions and try to navigate the talk to the direction you feel like because you know this is for you guys and we'll do uh, a bit of slides a bit of demo uh, and mix of whatever so we have just a uh, we have quite a lot of things that we can share and show you all right so first of all the the just to put us in you know we talk about the same thing so what what's form is about um, so it's about managing your life cycle of your system from the very beginning where it starts all the way to the, until it's running correctly and then the maintenance of that system all the time. And we talk about specifically uh, in this regard about provisioning, configuration, and monitoring of your configuration management. So when we talk about provisioning, we're basically uh, saying we want to solve the provisioning problem in that way that you don't really need to care about the details. Uh, whether it's a bare metal, virtual, public cloud, private cloud, doesn't matter. We want to make it very simple for you, ideally, to consume. And when we talk about configuration management, uh, we started mostly with Puppet and, and as an ENC and a report processor, um, and later on also added uh, Chef. Uh, if you're interested, we'll be happy to show that uh, as well. And, uh, and monitoring is basically ensuring that your infrastructure is the way it's, you, know, you design it. As the state that you've described is what's actually happening, and uh, oh great, I can not hear myself. That's it. <laughs> right. um, so when we talk about reporting, basically process what happened, what did your configuration management tool did, and whether it's the way it's supposed to be doing. Um, so in a nutshell, architecture, we have Foreman in the middle. It's a Ruby on Rails app. Um, we have you know traditional users, um, API or CLI. Um, or obviously the UI, uh, connected to various uh, either cloud backends or virtualization, uh, configuration management tools, and the smart proxies, which is more for traditional um, management of infrastructure that doesn't necessarily have an API, uh, like DNS or DCP in traditional data centers. Um, so smart proxies basically uh, the idea behind them, I don't know how many of you guys have the problem of segmented networks, large de deployments, I don't know how many of you are running in the cloud versus how many of you guys run real data center. Uh, but when you have multiple data centers or multiple environments, uh, the idea was to use one tool that uh, you 
can easily control the whole thing. You don't need to start having segmentation of your management infrastructure uh, just because it happens to be in a different place. Um, so the proxy was trying to get that also with, uh, you know, some uh, enterprise users have mixture maybe of Windows infrastructure and, uh, and, and Linux based, Unix based, so the proxy was supposed to gap, like if your DNS is hosted on Windows, uh, the proxy can gap that and manage the DNS uh, records on, on your Windows infrastructure. Uh, the config management, well you all, you all, you all know, uh, external node classific classification, so basically tell Puppet what this system is about. Uh, so Puppet asks us um, tell me what this is, here is the system fact, tell us what it is, what should run on it, which classes should be applied, and what are the parameters, and more interesting, what are the values. Um, and we added, st started to add uh, chef support, but obviously not in the same level at the moment, like Puppet is, uh, as a first class citizen. And uh, again, when we go back to provisioning, we're talking about uh, integrating with lots of uh, uh, various cloud virtualization providers. This actually, this list is actually out of date. Uh, in the last, since this, uh, we have Zen and Open Nebula, also contributed by uh, people in the community, which is awesome, uh, and as a plugin to form. Um, now we slowly started to enhance the functionality of the compute resources uh, in a way that we assume that. When someone deploys into a cloud or to a virtualization, he usually does not deploy into a single target. You usually have VMware EC2 or, or, or I don't know if you have any OpenStack or whatever target that you end up deploying, whether it's EC2 and Google Compute. And we tried to find ways to simplify uh, the one consuming it. And we came up with a way to abstract the type of system, like. Um, um, if I define small, I can define what small is on VMware, what small is on EC2, what small is on something else, and basically gives a user who consume form to say, I want to deploy small on VMware, and you get something. You got, and you can also say, I want to deploy small on EC2, but you know, the user only needs to care about the abstracted thing, doesn't really need to understand the different instance type and, and whatever it is. And, and we have... Um, the ability also to to join that with um, host group. Host group is the the thing that um, kind of a, it's kind of an object informant, which we try to uh, take the stack one level up. So I admit that sometimes that the term host group is misleading. Uh, the the idea of it is more to define something that describe your your deployment. Uh, so if it's your app or if it's your something. Um, so the host group is the thing that describes things like what is the operating system that you want to run on and what is your puppet configuration and also could also apply to your uh, deployment targets, for example if it's small, medium, large uh, and whatever it translates to the various uh, clouds and virtualization. Um, and by the way, feel free to stop me at any point in time. Um, yep. So the question is, how? What about security? And if I want to secure Foreman? Yeah, Foreman or the How do you do security with Puppet and Chef? Okay, so generic, generic question. I'll try to answer. Hopefully, I answer correctly uh, for what you meant. Uh, security in Puppet uses the things that has no bugs called OpenSSL. Um, <laughs> that uh, mostly this is the, ensures that the client and server can talk to each other. Uh, they will verify each other, so um, ideally if they're signed by the same certificate authority, uh, they trust only each other. Uh, when it comes to security in Foreman, um, it, it breaks through a couple of things. First of all is the user authentication. You can authenticate various web with uh, you know, known backends like Active Directory, uh, LDAP, FreeIPA, whatever services. We use third-party software like SSL, uh, LDAP, uh, or you know, Active Directory. So we we store user information in our system because we need to know things like your email or you know uh, things like that. But we don't necessarily use uh, the application is a full-blown 
enterprise grade application. So it knows how to hook into known authentication systems. Uh, that's one part. The other part is obviously that we really care about security. So we ensure that uh, the way that the client's data, like its facts, inventory data, uh, will get securely into the foreign server that only certain endpoints, like your puppet masters, are allowed to uh, update information about your systems. So it's a generic question. I don't know if you have anything specific that you. Okay. So this comes to so the question is how to architect Foreman. I'm just repeating for the video. So the question is how to architect Foreman in a secure way to, to architect your deployment. Um, I think that out of the box we provide a secure environment. That means if you use our installer and you just install it, um, you will get um, I think a pretty well defined Foreman instance that we are not aware of any uh, holes in, in the authentication authorization mechanism. Uh, that's in general. Now specific, since 1.5 there is a very very fine grained uh, role based active access control system that allows you to define exactly which users or groups of users can specifically access uh, specific resource like only this, only that, whatever. You can really define that a uh, given set of users can only manage a certain uh, host group, certain compute resources, or whatever. It's really, really dynamic. Uh, I'll show that in the demo. It's much easier than just to talk about it. Thank you. All right. Cool. Yep. How does Masterless Puppet works? works? No, we, how the <coughs> Okay. Um, so this is exactly the area. This is actually a good follow-up question because it relates a bit to the security of things. Um, generally, there's no problem. It works. You can upload your facts and you can do ANC queries to Foreman and you can send reports. The Puppet client works uh, very nicely without an issue. That means the old architecture still works. You are reducing a bit the security of your infrastructure because you allow every client to connect to Foreman versus uh, every client go through a Puppet Master and then goes to Foreman. Right? This is the normal path. Um, but it's possible, there was actually recent work in our installer to support uh, out of the box as an option in our installer to configure the infrastructure to allow... Um, so we, by default we restrict and only allow known puppet masters, that means puppet masters that have the smart proxy on them, uh, they only cannot, they, they and only they can upload information into Foreman. Um, you have to reduce the, the security setting. You have to basically say that you allow unknown clients initially, or uh, you know, basically you reduce the settings and then you could uh, sense facts with the node script that up, can upload its facts and you can configure the reports to go to your to your to your Foreman server directly. Okay, um, so it's possible. The short answer. Any more questions? Go. I'll continue. Uh, all right. So we have some new things that are happening. A lot of these things are happening from Foreman plugins. I don't know how many of you are aware exactly, but we since uh, I think six months now. So we started heavily to write uh, provide a framework for writing extensions to Foreman, uh, and those are known as Foreman plugins, and a lot of plugins starts to appear these days. Um, one of, a, a huge uh, plugin is Catello that we'll talk about later on. Um, but generally, uh, we have the ability now to, for um, a plugin, uh, have the ability to basically start creating images to quicker deployment times, so you can um, deploy a host group, let's say my database server, whatever, uh, we've all, and Foreman can, uh, once the initial deployment usually takes a while, uh, installs maybe the packages on the system, um, the next instance of that machine could be boot from an image, instead, assuming you're, you know, you're not a bare metal, uh, but uh, the next system can actually boot from an image that was snapshot from the, you know, from the first deployment. So it um, allows very, very fast uh, redeployment and in theory, we are looking into options like if your puppet reports contain package upgrades, and those package upgrades are longer than I don't know, a minute, go and create a snapshot of that host group, so next time you deploy another one like it, it will be very fast. 
So all kinds of optimizations to the deployment process based on your puppet data that uh, we can speed up things. Um, right, so in general provisioning, we try to be kind of a Swiss army knife. I don't know if we can call it like that, but we try to provide whatever option that makes sense for you to deploy. And we try from that traditional data center, you know, kind of uh, approaches, whether it's uh, uh, PXC obviously for bare metal and USB and ISO and eventually using things like IPXC. Uh, but also uh, when we go to cloud, you know, whether it's cloud in it, whether it's SSH or cloud and this is not supported, uh, and, and you know, whatever it is to get your system provisioned. And trying, not always succeeding, but trying to minimize the amount of effort you need to learn necessarily to deploy into a new cloud or to a new virtualization infrastructure. I'll try, I don't know if I can, I didn't prepare a demo, but usually, um, hold on, usually um, I'm showing like how can you deploy to OpenStack, maybe if, we, I don't know, if none of you, if anyone, if one of you ever, anyone here uses OpenStack? Well, okay, cool. So the, the idea was that most of the crowd usually don't actually use OpenStack, and we can demo how you can deploy into OpenStack without really knowing OpenStack, just by, uh, because we did all of the heavy lifting for you. Right, go ahead. I see several distribution deployments mentioned. What, what about Slack or Team Order and things like that? Uh, okay, the question was why are we don't have Slackware in this list? Yes. Um, so this is a community project and when there are community members uh, that care enough about a certain operating system we added, for example we have FreeBSD here, this was just because someone has an itch and he wanted it to be in this list. So we actually wrote the code in a way that allows fairly easily to add an operating system support. Uh, it's not a tool that's designed to work only with Red Hat based or Debian based system. It's actually, it, you know, it supports Solaris uh, and, and, and you know, things like that that are completely different in terms of processes and how they're deployed. We even have users deploy Windows with it, so it's really... Um, uh, well, it's not, you have to write code to support it. It's not, you know, there are, every operating system has its own tweaks that you need to know. It doesn't just work, right? You, someone needs to map uh, the objects that we have in to the actual things that needs to get done in order to deploy it. But we've done most of the, most of the work has been done in Formant to generalize it as much as possible. If you look at the code of how much code is it to deploy Red Hat, for example, I think something like 50 lines, you know, of code, not something very, very complicated. So I'll be, we'll be more than happy to have Slackware here on this list. Seriously, I mean, if it's something that you care about, uh, we'll be more than happy to support you doing that. Okay. Right. Uh, all right. So we have some. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, the Pixie Base discovery is that something you're going to talk about? Oh yeah, later? sure. I, I I didn't make it too quick. Um, so. Discovery is a mechanism in Formant, again a plugin, uh, that enables you or a user um, to have unknown hardware, mostly bare metal, but you can do it with it as well, but uh, uh, hardware which is unknown to boot into some uh, kind of a minimized uh, Linux operating system that has no state, basically doesn't write anything to the disk or anything like that, but recognize all of the system uh, inventory. The system boots up and report to Formant and then Formant can uh, then provision it um, without actually going and touching any of the hardware. So assuming you have a, a rack of new hardware, you power it on or plug it in, power it on, it gets discovered, you don't need to type MAC addresses, IPMI credentials, anything like that, just power it on, register it to Foreman, and you can start consuming it directly without physically going and touching or anything like that. Is that good enough? Or? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, probably you can, maybe we have a demo. If, if, if the internet will not fail us, then we'll try to do a short demo of that. Um, we have a layer of orchestration, there's actually multiple layers of orchestration in Foreman, um, but I just wanted to highlight one of them. Um, basically, when we create a VM or a bare metal or a cloud instance, whatever, we try to, it's not enough just to create the VM and not power it on and move on, but we actually try to, to register and do actions that are normally needed to get the system you know, fully running and, and configured the way it's supposed to be. 
So things like DNS, right? What's usually if a system has no DNS record and you run an application on it and you expect someone to actually consume that DNS entry, or usually we, you know, we, so we register a DNS for you, both reverse and uh, and, pro and uh, A and, and A records. Uh, we'll, you know, uh, write this, uh, manage the puppet certificates for you. Uh, obviously, create the disk for the VM, whatever it is, depends on the on the um, um, process. And it's very easy also for another plugin for for foreign hooks that Dominic here wrote uh, allows us to extend it and add your own operating operation in the lifecycle of uh, of, a, of a system. So whenever you can register it into your database, like if you have a CMDB, if you care about those kind of things, so you can just write a script and emails or whatever. So you can kind of an extendable framework for you uh, to do actions when something happened in the lifecycle of a system. Um, uh, on a side note, I don't have a slide for it, but we're actually working on a new orchestration framework uh, which will allow multi-host deployments. That means if you have an application which consists of multiple systems, um, then we can deploy it as a unit. This is something that we're doing as part of the efforts of deployment OpenStack. Now there's an um, effort to make Foreman deploy OpenStack, and OpenStack is real OpenStack deployment starts from seven or eight nodes in the HA configuration. So that was ne necessary to, to support kind of that kind of thing. Uh, we talked earlier about enterprise, so Foreman is really used in a lot of large scale organizations. Um, and the aim is to make it not just the tool uh, that solves a problem, a technical problem to provision, but also as a way to integrate with the requirement of an enterprise. Uh, whatever it's meaning, we talked about users, authentication, we also talk about role based, we talk about auditing, uh, all kinds of things like that that are required um, you know, in, a, in a large scale group that means you have a lot of users that actually use it and consume it and have everyone has its own permissions and so on. Uh, further on there's also the ability to segment partition the infrastructure to multi-tenancy by different organizations and locations and, and basically restrict down what can you do in terms of permission. Uh, we talked enough about plugins and obviously also API we have a Multiple version. Anyone here uses the API? One. Okay. Couple. Okay, that's great. So we care about a lot about you guys. Uh, we don't want to break your stuff. So we actually have multiple versions of the API. So you can um, build stuff on top of Foreman because we know a lot of guys have to deploy their own service on top of it. So um, basically, we ensure that we have um, a very robust API as much as we can and continuously improve it by, but while at the same time not breaking the older versions of it. So whatever you develop is not, does not get broken. Um, anyone here uses the CLI? What do you think of it? It's good. It's good? You like it? Can improve? What can improve? I don't know. I mean, I, at the moment, I, I like it. Is there anything you can do with the CLI that is important for you? Uh, I'm not sure if the public mass code is already there, but I think it is. That's the one thing which I was missing. Okay, good. You, um, you are raising, so. Yeah, we use the CLI a lot. Take, a, take my notes? Yeah, we're still in your notes. Uh, we use the CLI a lot, actually, because we have developers that like to destroy and rebuild clusters on the fly, step one of troubleshooting. So I'm not doing that by hand. And one of the things that we like to do with the CLI would be change puppet classes. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen that in the docs. And the docs are a little lacking. Okay. Um, there's a couple other things, like uh, trigger rebuilds, uh, and things like that would be nice, too. Okay. There, actually, I think there's solutions for everything you asked for. That's but, nice. but, um, Okay. If not, it's a documentation gap. Yeah. And, and yeah, I can tell that the API wise, at least everything is ready. So um, I can show you workarounds at least. If, sure. If if you're something that you still miss. <coughs> All right. It's confusing sometimes that the actions that you do with CLI do not correspond to the one that you do with the API. So if you do the host to the CLI, it doesn't delete all the reports. It doesn't delete the reports. Okay. Less than one. Um. It could be multiple reasons for that. A, it could be a bug. 
just that you know the delete action in the CLI maps exactly to the same delete action you do in the UI. So it could be a bug. Sometimes it's a permission issue that you have no right permissions to. It's, it's not that it means basically when it's set to be, they host to be. Yes. Normally it's due through the UI, there is also the old reports. Right. Due to the CLI, I, I find the reports still there. So I, I would double check if it's not a permission issue because sometimes the user has the ability to delete hosts but not reports. Somehow we separated those two permissions for good or bad and, and you might end up deleting hosts but not deleting the reports. Even though I don't think it should allow you to do that. So I'll, if you want to, if you can show me, I'll be more than happy to to see. Unless Dominic tells me there's an open bug about it, and I'll just shut, shut, shut. Okay, so I'll shut up. You're right. I'm wrong. <laughs> All right, that is a bug then. Yep. So is everything that you can do from the GUI available on the API and is it doing... I think the... the yeah, so the question was if you, everything you can do in the API is doable for the UI and vice versa, right? Yeah. Um, I think if there are gaps, there are minor. Um, generally, we try to develop parity between the UI and API. Uh, I know there are some things that we try to do on the UI first because we know that API we don't want to break. So we try to, when we, there's a feature which is, we think is the right feature, but we want to have some user feedback before we finalize it. I mean, we finalize it, but sometimes there's like, uh, for example, in the, use, in the compute profile feature uh, that allows you to abstract the type of machine across providers. Uh, we were not 100% sure if that's what people want in the beginning. So initially we wrote the feature, but didn't write the, the API. To create a new one, we had an API to consume it. Like when you create a new system or a new host, you can consume it. But uh, so we try. Depends on the scenario. Um, sometimes we say a feature is not complete before the API is there. Sometimes we can, you know, we be a bit more flexible. But in general, there is an, a very good parity between the two. If you have a specific question, you know, something specific to uh, to that you, you're missing, I'll be more than happy to try to address it. No, just, just asking whether the API was the first class and everything built on top of it. Well, so. we, so this is actually um, uh, an ongoing discussion that we have. The UI is not built on top of the API, uh, <coughs> initially. Other plugins like Catello that you'll see soon actually does that. So, uh, but we do have the, there's an ongoing discussion if we want to go in that direction as well. Um, but we definitely consider the API the first class citizen for the CLI and that you can do everything around it. So <coughs> it's not that the API is somewhere on the side and we ignore it. We actively work on it all the time. Right. Yeah. There's a 100% test coverage on the, you know, the API. It's not a... and, and so on. Right. Um, so, mentioned the, the, the CLI. The nice thing about the CLI, I think, we, besides the fact we try to model it like uh, very closer to to Git modules, and also to thank Brian for the name uh, here, right? You're part of that. Brian wrote our first CLI basically back in the day. So um, um, Hammer is um, also trying to be adaptive to the forming configuration that you have because the fact that we can have multiple plugins, um, the CLI also has plugins by itself. And in recent versions, the CLI actually learned from the API. It learns exactly what is installed and actually create on the fly the commands and everything. So we try to be a bit more, I don't know, uh, interesting de uh, deployment. So it fits to, you, to the target form and server that you run on. Uh, OK, this is actually, I'm going to skip this. Is a, I choose a bad presentation for this. OK, jumping here. Uh, community will be celebrating five years. Uh, in September, um, which is a really big milestone for me, uh, I think for us. The stats here are actually out of date. This is a, this is a slide from, uh, that I, did, I used in February in Fostum, and roughly the numbers are close, close to 300 users on IRC. Um, I think we got much closer to 200 contributors these days, and languages are around 10 translated languages. So basically the stats, you could increase 20% for most of them. Um, so, if you're part of that community, I really thank you for being part of it and making the, you know, our day-to-day -day work awesome. 
Um, I think it's much more interesting to, sh to see some demo. So I'm going to join with Dominic um, to do some, uh, some demo and see Foreman in action. All right? You want to demo? Any questions in the window? Yeah. So on the orchestration page that you had up, it said that something about supporting rollback. Uh, right. So for example, uh, let's say you try to in a, a new system or a new host and you fail to create the disk of the VM. So I don't want to leave you uh, kind of DNS records. But for, so for example, when we create a VM, we'll try first to create a DNS record because that's fast. It doesn't take a lot of time. But when you create the VM, creating the disk might take a while. So we prioritize which one should go first. And then if the disk fails, I don't know, you're out of quota, for example, then we roll back and do, we delete all the changes. If there is an error, you get you get back to the form and give you the error, and you can try to fix it and go again. So, building on that, right? So you said you now can orchestrate over a, a set of hosts. So what happens if one of those hosts fails? Roll back the entire deployment. So at the moment we're in the early days, uh, so we don't actually roll back the deployment yet. It's not a transactive, but I definitely see ourselves. We have all the mechanism all the plumbing to do that. Um, we initially started with bare metal deployments because we were targeting deployment with OpenStack across bare metal. Um, but VMs are so much easier so we can just trust them if it fails. So it's still on you know in progress. Yep. Sorry, which VM is the fast which VM should I use for forming? Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Just, we don't care. You can also use whatever database like Postgres or MySQL. Uh, we're very flexible. We try to be flexible with requirements. Um, if, if there are some plugins that will force you to have more specific configuration, like more, like later on we'll talk about Catello, it needs a bit more memory and things like that. But uh, generally, you're welcome to use whatever you have. Some people, are known, don't know why, are known to run it on Raspberry Pi. So I can't say it's production, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, how much is it contingent on the owning and uh, controlling networking portions of it, uh, the environment? Like, can you, can you build a secret key where you can build a server anywhere, or it can phone home and get set up or something along those lines, or do you really need to work through the smart car? So the smart proxies were designed to traverse your network where for, for various reasons, right? If you don't necessarily have a, if you don't want your clients to be able to call home, sometimes you, you want to disconnect the two, right? Your user are using the service, you don't want your service to come in and also consume it. Uh, you can install the proxy on the same box as Foreman, that works, and all in one kind of configuration and that works. So it's up to you to, the default in deployment will install it all, you know, together. And large deployments have, hun, uh, I don't know, hundreds, but a, a big amount of, of uh, like the largest deployment we have is 60,000 nodes, and they have, uh, I, I would assume, around hundreds of proxies. So, you know, it scales and it depends really uh, what is your use case. resources yeah. to be, um, it's a way, you can actually do that um, by con combination of, uh, you know, assigning uh, resources to users, like system hosts to users and assigning uh, specific permissions. Uh, I know that um, a very large deployment of Foreman and Jenkins integration, uh, basically, uh, again, we have a plugin that marks the resources with another attribute and then they build a higher level tool to consume the, uh, you know, it's really partition and segment, kind of a Jenkins that requests resources and get out the fly resources based on pools. Like they created pools of hardware and then Jenkins will pull up 
Um, so it's something you can build. It's not out of the box. Um, but I'll be more than happy if you have a use case in mind. Really happy to learn what you want. Maybe you know it's an easy way to bridge the two requirements. Bridge the requirements. Right, I'm going to hand it to Dominic and we'll have lots of time for questions. Uh, <coughs> what? Sorry? Uh, okay, I'll try. Um, okay, so for those of you who never saw Foreman, this is Foreman. Um, without the multi org feature, basically a simplified interface showing here the dashboard. Um, here we can see Puppet um, information based on Puppet reports. So this basically shows us how many systems are, whatever the state of the system is, whether it's uh, ran, send up a report, whether the puppet succeeded or failed uh, in, in uh, configuring the system. Uh, usually you have the uh, good host, that means that they ran puppet, nothing happened. You have the active host that uh, ran puppet and performed the change successfully, and you have host that didn't run puppet, and so on. And you can drill down, you can click on, on any one of those metrics and you can actually see the, the systems based on their status. Uh, you can also see the report itself and inside the report you can see exactly what happened. You can see, if the, for example, the NTP file was changed and exactly what is the content that was changed. Mm -hmm. So that we never did this together. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. We, we both, we, we work together but we are not working in the same country. So it's kind of nice. Too. Collaboration was okay. Um, uh, in general, we have seen here uh, the the list of hosts. Um, you can see here again small indication of the status, like out of sync, okay, uh, waiting to be provisioned. So uh, in a build mode, you can see the various operating system and uh, what is their host group, where are they running. Uh, if it's a virtualization, we would see the the model as the virtualization platform and in here we see a very uh, overview of what's going on the, the graphs here show puppet uh, run metrics and also how many things we got applied failed uh, you know performance and so on we get all kind of properties about the system uh, I think maybe you can show uh, facts for a second um, these are uh, yeah, okay. yeah. uh, this is like that was supposed to happen um, so it doesn't work. Okay. Okay. In a second. We'll wait. Um, we can see all the system reports. We can see uh, exactly what Papa did. We can see that uh, here over time. Um, you can see that the search is pretty much baked into everything in the app. That means um, when you search for a given host, for a given ho uh, sorry, for a given report, for a given host, um, we can pretty much uh, filter everything. So the, the thing is, the, the, the concept behind it is that you're going to have lots of systems. And when you have lots of systems, it's really difficult to, you know, think about it when you go to the internet. You, do you want to see the entire internet in your browser or do you want to be able to search for it, right? So you know where you, you're going, you're going towards searching and finding what you're looking for. So the same principle happens also in Formula where we try to show you, giving you the ability always to filter and not create specific screens based on puppet environment or based on, on something else. Um, all right, so uh, maybe you can show... Yeah, yeah go for it. So OPAP mentioned compute resources earlier, which are our abstraction on top of virtualization, hypervisors and different cloud platforms. So this virtual machine, well one dogsample.com, is running on my laptop via libvirt on KVM. Um, we've got support uh, for provisioning and also some basic uh, power management, console management um, and other basic VM capabilities. So via the browser uh, using the HTML5 plugin I'm able to view the console uh, over VNC or over Spice. So giving me a one-stop shop for uh, managing it. Um, I can also do power management through here turn it off the VM, turn it on. Whether this is on, uh, on the hypervisor, on a cloud platform, or even bare metal via IPMI integration. You guys thought about a confirmation dialogue on that? <coughs> Control no, the lead button? <laughs> that host doesn't do anything, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so we support 
whole variety of computer resources. Um, I think there's a list in the presentation. Uh, we've got Bill coming in via, um, via plugins as well now. A few people have started up a Zen plugin, uh, an open Nebula plugin as well. Um, all sorts of possibilities there too. So you can provision new machines straight from the Foreman UI via the new host pool and using things I've already set up. So I've already got my host group set up, which is my definition of how my new system is going to look like, which public classes may be applied, or which operating system I'm going to use. So I can select from uh, so uh, You can see in the naming it's got a slash there. You can nest your host groups and create little hierarchies of a uh, base host group with more specialties like uh, roles, uh, regions, or uh, uh, departments or environments. We're able to select the hypervisor for compute results from a list here, or we can choose its bare metal and enter a, pic, uh, a MAC address for Pixie. And then we're given a few other things here. Um, when we're deploying onto a compute resource, we can choose a profile which acts like a flavour. It's a small machine, so it's going to get this number of vCPUs on invert. Or you create a large machine, it's given a 30 or 200 gig disk to begin with. And my host group here is filled in a whole bunch of extra information. So the domain I'm going to use for my libvirt networking is example.com. Or the realm, which I've left blank, enables free IPA integration. So automatically set up your key tab and Kerberos integration. I've also got the subnet selected here. So this will set up DHCP uh, with TFTP for Pixie booting. And it's allocated an IP address from the subnet too. The operating system, we support yeah, a number of different families and they all, they all have installation media associated. So I've, I'm pointing to a local mirror here for RAL, um, separate partition tables and separate templates. And you can also customise the templates on a per environment or a per host group basis too. So you can customise them and script inside them as they are ERB, similar to Puppet's templating system. Click this button, you'll see a here. And all the templates I've got available for this operating system. So we have Pixie Linux templates for the TFTP Pixie booting. Uh, we've got Finnish templates if I was doing image based provisioning, iPixie, the Kickstart itself, which we call a provision, and user data if again I was deploying onto something like EC2 or OpenStack that can use Cloud Edit. You can also delve into the virtual machine information. This I've actually set up using that compute profile of my flavour for the virtual machine. And then when I press submit, it's going to go through the orchestration steps that I have mentioned. So we far too fast. We should have got a sleep in there. We had DHCP, we had DNS, we had TFTP. All the necessities to create the virtual machine for it to boot up. Pixie boot and install the operating system. So you can see here the VM's already running. We're already into Anaconda and installed it. So at this point, it's downloading the Kickstart from Foreman itself. It's put in a request. Foreman in the background, um, if I'd chosen it as a puppet host, it would also be helping us with the certificates, ensuring that this machine when it boots up, it's going to get signed by the puppet master via auto sign. And the rest is um, <coughs> history. It's a typical case start and still. Do you guys have any kind of support for uh, serial console versus VGA uh, console? So the question was if we had support for serial consoles versus VGA. We don't at the moment. Um, we've talked about putting support in the proxy with, to use IPMI to get serial consoles for their metal hosts back end. Um, it's possible we could do the same for virtual machines too. But the BMC IPMI integration is probably up next. So. Yeah, but you can easily configure it. It's not, we don't show the console output to UI, mm -hmm. but there's no problem to 
change the template to add a zero, zero months of options. So it's important. Good question. Yeah. For things like DNS and DCP, uh, who is who's providing the service? Is Foreman integrating with your existing providers of those services, or is Foreman the DCP server or the DNS server? So the question was, is Foreman the DNS server? Or a DHCP server, or is it uh, using a standalone existing service? Um, Foreman, Foreman Smart Proxy is managing the existing service. So we don't provide DNS, DHCP, TFTP ourselves. We're using your standard OS demons for that. So here I'm using uh, Libvirt's DNS mask, and the Foreman Smart Proxy is providing an API <coughs> Libvirt. So it's saying, Foreman's able to say, create me a DNS record. And the smart proxy's job is to create a DNS record in libvirt or in uh, bind, or is to create a DHCP reservation in IC, DHCPD, or Active Directory. So if you're doing like fancy DNS, like split DNS, you know, you have external and internal records, um, do you have to teach the smart proxy your setup, or how does that? So you, you configure the domains that Form is going to manage uh, through here, so through the UI, and you put a a smart proxy on each of your DNS servers that you need to manage. Uh, for split horizon DNS, Foreman itself needs to be able to look up the domains and host names it's managing, um, but it, it will still perform all of the queries via the smart proxies it has access to. So Foreman will make a query to your internal DNS server, or smart proxy, or your external DNS smart proxy, and if, if it's split horizon, it doesn't really matter. So we can see the various resources, you know, domains, subnets, uh, which give you an example. This is my libvirt domain again, and we select the proxy that's responsible for managing DNS forward records through this interface. Uh, similarly, via the subnet, uh, we can manage the DNS proxy that's responsible for the reverse zone. So through here we have proxies too for DHCP, TFTP, and reverse DNS. So moving on to Puppet, um, we import Puppet classes via a smart proxy again. The smart proxy is an agent to manage the servers, a DNS server, DHCP, or it's there to manage and, um, yeah, manage and provide an API to a Puppet master. So you can store the smart proxy alongside your Puppet Master and then we pass all of your Puppet Manifests through all of your modules and environments installed on the Puppet Master to get a list of all of the classes available to us and all of their parameters. So looking at the DNS class, uh, this is one of ours from our installer, the installer itself is Puppet Based. We can see all of the parameters that are exposed on the DNS top level class and we can drill in and make modifications to this. So we override it, so we're going to manage this. Form is going to manage the value of uh, uh, folders. We've got di uh, different type validation, uh, validation of values and data types. So we can say that this is a string and array. And then we can provide values in a hierarchical manner using specific overrides. So we can say for this value, this DNS folder, well it's first going to matter if we've got an override for a specific FQDN. So we're adding this DNS class to a host and we're saying this FQDN needs this value of folders. Or hosts in domain example.com are going to need a different value for their folders. Or we have a default value at the bottom. So you can have a complex hierarchy of attributes of the host or facts of the host that determine what value your public class parameters get. So popping back to the public class screen, trying to do this one handed. NTP module in here too. So this is installed on one of my public masters. We can see it's available in the pub environment example. Load of parameters we can manage through here. Now I'm 
managing the server list parameter, and we've got a number of defaults here. So we've got standard NTP pool. And then if we go down, you can see I've changed the, the NTP service that hostinexample.com are going to get. So if you're building hostinexample.com, then if you get that uh, NTP server. We come back to use this when we're so when we're creating or editing hosts. So I've got uh, rel one back here. And this is in the example dot sorry, example puppet environment. And it's using my puppet.example.com uh, puppet masters and puppet CAs. So we have a shopping cart type system for choosing which classes you're going to apply to your host and this is done through Puppet's external node classifier interface. So Puppet's going to call out a form and saying this, this host, row one's checking in which classes and which parameters do we need to build in. So we add the NTP class onto the host or we use config groups which are collections of classes. And then back here on the parameters tab changing that later. Um, so we have the NTP server list parameter. So this is the value we've got because this host is in the example.com domain. It's overridden automatically. Or we can override it for this individual host. So let's just change that to NTP1. So in, the scene, in behind the scenes that's creating a new and you override, so we're saying for this FQDN, we're going to get that NTP server instead. Question in the back. How does it call? Is it calling it from Hira? Is it populating Hira? Yeah. No, it's a different implementation to Hira. So Hira plugs into Puppet's data binding uh, mechanism. Foreman instead, um, it's going to show me my password again, isn't it? That's another <laughs> server. <laughs> Instead, uses Puppet's external node classifier interface. So we pass Puppet this YAML file, and this is a sort of computed version of all the classes that we need and all the parameters that we need. You can still use it in addition to Hira if you wish. So instead of us passing the server list for the NTP class through, we just pass through the list of classes, and then data binding in Hira will look up the rest. But Foreman has its own different implementation of hierarchical look so um, I know five uh, uh, one five introduced uh, two groups, but I still use host groups. Is that still sticking around for the puppet profiles, if you will? Or right. So the question right? was sorry. The question was in form one point five. We introduced config groups into these replace your use of host groups. Uh, the answer is no. They they, um, they complement it. So config groups are designed to, I think of them as kind of macro, it's a, a list of classes uh, that you can apply in one batch. So here I've got my base config group, and I can pick classes from any Puppet environment and add them to this config group. So I'm going to say, well, in my base I'm going to need NTP, and standard lib say, and that's going to be one group of three classes. Now we can take this config group and apply it to a host group too. First I'm just going to create a second. Yep. Oh, this <coughs> gets around a machine only belonging to, to one host group, is that the point? That's right, so it, um, a host only belongs to a single host group, but either a host or a host group may have multiple config groups. So we can now say edit this host group, have multiple sets of puppet classes assigned to that, or we could do it on the host itself. Or so this, yeah, directly on the host. Yes. I mean, on the hierarchy as well. That's the various level of the hierarchy. Right. So I'd say you, you don't need to 
attach these config groups to any, to the end host group. You could put it at your base host group, for example. Any, any point in the host group hierarchy, and they'll flow through. So you can reuse these config groups on multiple host groups, or you can reuse them on multiple hosts as well. It's like a one, one click way to a whole bunch of classes. Yep. So in the first part, you have a whole bullet point of monitoring. Um, and I wasn't clear what I was monitoring how this build this, but I'm interested in monitoring. You know, so, so now you have these classes or are these, these attributes or whatever. Um, it would be nice to have a monitoring piece for maybe the NTP part or the, or the Apache part or the Squid part or each of those. So can you explain to something about how traditionally the other, not monitoring of the building, but just the monitor, monitoring of the deployed server looks into something. Right. So monitoring from informant is primarily monitoring the conflict management system and the life cycle of the host. So that's via reports and via facts. We also have statistics and trending functions within Vorman, so we're able to monitor your state as a whole. So being able to see, um, let's say, memory distribution across your estate, or which operating systems or public versions you have deployed. Um, I think one of the OPW projects is a monitoring. So we're participating in the No Average Program for Women program at the moment. And one of the projects we have going there is integration with Nagios, I believe. And so creating a plugin to Foreman, um, probably better installer integration too, to bring the two together. So service monitoring as well as infrastructure monitoring. So keep an eye on that. Is this in a version control system? No, it's not a version control system. 
Everything is stored in Formas database, which if you're using the installer is PostgreSQL by default. Um, and it's a Ruby on Rails, implemented as a Ruby on Rails application. The API and CLI though both have give you import export capabilities. So if you're using the CLI for example, uh, there's a CSV uh, format to it as well, which is useful to get data back out if you want to. So I'm not trying to lock you in by doing it, just trying to give you better uh, features. Yep. Um, would the, the instead of entering MAC addresses, you could have like a list of all the servers that you have so you could provision them, or how is that how would that work? So being able to enter multiple MAC addresses for yeah. provisioning lots of servers. The web UI as it stands doesn't give you a bulk management interface for creating new servers. The best way to do that would be via the CLI. Because the CLI you can script you know, one line bash command to loop around list of MAC addresses and add your hosts. The second way of doing it is the discovery mechanism that OHAP mentioned earlier. So the discovery plugin means you you pixie boot all of those servers into a little mini image and that registers them back to form. So just by powering on those 50 machines, they're all going to show up in the form of web interface and then you can rebuild them straight into the OS from there. So that's a, a good way of doing all problems. And then just one other follow-up, I guess, is um, this commands that you're doing here, the configuration is actually informed or the configuration is, has, has, has been back in, is back in public? So like if, like say your form and server dies, it loses all this information you've customized in here? Or would it carry on to the public configuration? We've backed up your server, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> your, all of this data is stored in Formus database. Um, if you have your database backed up, then it's just a case of reinstalling Formus. But yeah, if you lost the database, you'd lose the overrides and class information you've put together here. Um, if you're dealing with hosts, they they repopulate pretty quickly, so you'd, uh, we'd learn about the hosts as they come in through puppet facts and puppet reports. You wouldn't you'd lose the class associations and parameter information you've associated with them. But that's a good way to also bring new machines online is just to point them at your puppet master and we pick up them. There is a cache on the puppet for the MR. Right, so there's a cache as well for the ENC interface between puppet and forming. In case Foreman does go down temporarily. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how different is Puppet, I'm sorry, how different is Foreman uh, with Chef? How different is Foreman and Chef? Um, it's Puppet and Chef, you want to be comparing there. Um, yeah, yeah. How different is Foreman with Chef? So if oh, you have. Sorry. How, how different is Foreman with Chef as opposed to Foreman and Puppet? I'll show you. So I've got a separate Foreman instance running up here. Um, coupled with the Chef Open Source Server and the Chef Client. And this is done uh, using a plugin to Foreman. Again, this is getting a bit old. Um, Foreman Chef plugin allows us to store uh, attributes and reports back from Chef. So the Chef handler is able to send back its report in a similar way to Puppet does at the end of its Puppet runs. Otherwise, the interface is very similar. We combine facts and reports in the same way. Uh, we try and make it fairly, um, fairly interchangeable between the two. And the main difference at the moment is, let me just run the chef client. So running the chef client, it's just going to push its facts up first to the server, do the run. You can see it's running handles at the moment. That will show up in the web UI. Chef client. If we refresh. So reports come in from the chef client, and we can see all of the actions that it's made. So it's much the same as a puppet report here. And we even get diffs through in the same way as puppet share diff. <coughs> um, so it gives you one, you know, one view onto your hosts, no matter which config management system they're using. One moment. Um, the only other thing is we don't currently manage the run list of Chef file for me. So in this instance, I've got the Chef server web UI up there managing the run list through that. Um, but Mara Kulan who, uh, and Romain, who are both working on the Chef integration, are looking at combining those config groups with Chef roles to give you an equivalent way of managing Chef clients. Right. So when, when 
the inventory service, uh, it's like the OI attributes versus Puppet facts. Um, is it either or, or can you have like Puppet and Chef clients in a given form and instance? I know you, I noticed for your demo you had a separate one, but in a, in a mixed configuration management shop, could it be pointed at one form and server, or is it one form and server per configuration management system? Like, have you abstracted inventory? So the question is, have we abstracted inventory enough that you can have both Chef and Puppet facts and attributes on the same server, or if they have to be separate? They can be on the same server. Uh, so facts, the informer's terminology, um, it can either be a standard Puppet fact or it can be a Chef fact, and we can store both in the same instance and in the same database. Um, I'm doing it on two separate systems just because I've got a plugin installed on one and not the other. Um, but you, by design, so you should be able to manage both systems from the same instance. Yep. Uh, any plans for Ansible and that sort of thing? Or? Any plans for Ansible? Um, or yes, we would love someone to put Ansible support for us. Um, we have, there are some issues there. Um, <coughs> many of the concepts map directly into what we're doing with Chef and with Puppet. Um, there are quite a few people interested in both Ansible and Salt support. Um, so a few people are beginning to work on it. Um, we'd really like to be able to connect people together and tackle the problem. Yeah, we'd, we'd love that. Uh, back. Um, any plans on supporting Puppet Defines, uh, the values for the code defines, like the Apache Mimos module, for example, for Puppet Labs? So the question is, do we plan to support Puppet Defines, so individual resources? I'd like to. Um, we're currently constrained by the external node classifier interface between us and Puppet. So the ENC interface only lets us give a list of classes and parameters for those. The define is an individual resource in essence, and the ENC interface doesn't let us specify individual resources. Um, somebody started writing a plugin for this, and it's back on the list of plugins wiki page if you want to have a look. Um, it currently only exposes an API, but the idea was to store information about individual resources in Formas database, and then combine that with create group, the create resources function in public core to instantiate all those resources from the form and ENC output. So I think that would be the way to go, or to contribute some code to public core to get the ENC ex interface expanded. I think probably a wrapper around for creating resources would be best. Thank you. So there's one more over here. Uh, so outside, whatever, how, is, how easy is it to model containers and new resources? How easy is it to model containers? So we currently have some preliminary Docker support in Foreman. So the Foreman Docker <coughs> plugin adds Docker as a compute resource into Foreman. And so they appear as separate hosts as opposed to containers on a particular host. So that's our first foray into the area. Um, it would probably be good to treat them as first class citizens as well, um, differently to hosts. Um, but yeah, the beginnings are there. Last question, then we'll move on. So this is just a comment. Didn't somebody provide BSD jail support at some point? BSD jail support, I don't recall that.
an OpenStack controller to come up before you start deploying your OpenStack compute nodes or make chain deployments. Yes, I, mean, uh, I think that could possibly be useful. Like, you could deploy this in a rack. You know, say there's 20 different servers in that rack. It'd be nice to be able to feed a configuration directly into the deployment server and then it takes that configuration and applies it to everything. And it's almost like building up an entire whole mini project. Yeah, so whole rack deployments being able to give a, a sort of prescribed configuration to multiple, multiple machines is where Statecraft in particular is going. So they've integrated the discovery mechanism with the orchestration. So you're able to power up those 20 machines and have them register. So if they're waiting for their operating system and configuration, and then start orchestrating them one by one to build up your cluster. So you know, a, lot, a lot of these plugins are beginning to work together in quite cool ways. So I'll quickly take you around the RBAC system and the user side just to show you um, how the administration for when itself works. So I'm logged in, in as the uh, default admin user at the moment. And we can go create new users through here. So this is where we are storing some user information in our database. Just logins, <coughs> email addresses, and also where to authenticate them with. So we can authenticate them onto, say, an LDAP backend, or using Kerberos, or remote user Apache. Um, we also have RBAC exposed through here, both to individual users and groups of users, which is new in Forma 1.5. So I have some basic read-only roles set up here, or I have site manager roles that allow full read-write across all of the resources, domains and hosts in my system. This is Forma 1.4. Let's try 1.5. 1.5 is the latest. It's better to have a roles tab. So the same sorts of roles apply here. And then we could go through and configure those roles. So you know, a manager, for example, is going to have read-write access to certain resources. This role gives access to loads. So we can say for compute resources, for example, a manager's able to change, uh, able to view, power things on and off, destroy them. And a tick box indicates they're able to fill on every compute resource we've got stored in Foreman. If you want to start making more fine-grained controls over your users, we can create a filter now that says, well, you've got compute resources, and we want to give you, let's say, the ability to view and edit them, but not delete them. But using the search functionality that's at the top of every form and page, we can say only the ones with one. So using this search functionality, the filters, roles, and user groups, you can lock down access to resources, whether that's compute resources, hosts, domains, anything else you can manage via the form web UI or API. It's cool. I agree. Okay, the plugins are interested in their own permissions. Yeah, plugins can do their own. Uh, so I may have one on here. I don't have many plugins enabled right now. So check which plugins you have enabled. Excellent idea. Let's see which plugins I've got. Yes, yeah, boot disks are what I've got. <coughs> yeah. So I've got boot disk installed at the moment. Uh, boot disk is a plugin that does ISO and USB boot disk creation, so it spits you out a USB disk that you could boot up a server with, skipping Dixie and DHCP. But for example, that's a permission that this plugin added. It doesn't have very many, but you can do the same sort of filtering actions on other plugins. Can you assign 
can you do filters based on user attributes and if they're an LDAP user? Yeah. Um, same, we, we still create the user informants database if it's an LDAP user, and all of the same attributes work in the same way. Um, we do synchronize some of the attributes down when the user logs in, or if we refresh their group membership, which is coming in 1.6. Important also that I have information to a group of users, and the group of users can be mapped on an LDAP. So user. mapping of user groups to roles is the key thing, 1.5 that helps us make this. The second is going to be a 1.6 when we do LDAP group support, because that means you create your user externally, you assign the user to the group externally, but you've already got the mapping of permissions to that group in LDAP. So on login you've got permission. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think I'm done with the uh, formal demonstration. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll get into some customization 
of the repo in a second, but currently it does seem good to be repository. Are you showing 1.4 or 1.5? So this is, um, I'm not going to say 1.5 because it's probably going to be 2.0. Okay. Um, but this is not 1.4. 1.4 is really old. It's eight, nine months old. Um, we, we just haven't been able to get out due to the massive you know, rewriting and refactoring. I uh, haven't been able to get out the new version. We have nightly if you do want to test it out. But the, the we're hoping to get 2.0 out in the next month, we'll say. Okay. This is last night's I think. Yes, this is last night's I think. Uh, How is it managing the sufficient to red hat? Does it need to be does it need to be installed on a relevant box or to do that sync with the repo? It doesn't, it can be installed on a sub so I can sync box. I can sync a distro that I have on exactly. license. Um, so you can log into the customer support portal and actually download a, a entitlement manifest uh, and import it into Catello. Okay. Uh, I won't go through that here because I don't have a manifest handy. But and then enable the Red Hat repositories through a slightly different interface. You didn't import manifest, I did not. Okay. Uh, and then they, they'll just show up here. You'll see Red Hat Enterprise Linux and the repositories that you you've enabled from your system. Um, I'm not sure if you really you mentioned this, the overview of Catello and you know, what it's for. I so I, I briefly mentioned the content management and yeah, um, nice. patch management. So the idea is, is systems or hosts uh, register to Catello. You can see what packages are installed. You can see what package updates are available. If you're using Red Hat or another, anything else that provides a raw information in their young repository, you can see what a raw or applicable and apply those. We've got a lot of like CVE work plans. You can see what CVEs are applicable. So if Heartbleed comes out, what are all my systems that are vulnerable to Heartbleed? Things like that. Okay, so uh, I sort of went through the other repository. We can actually click here. So we can actually see the Yum repository published. So that's the mirror level. Yes, yeah, this is the local mirror you can see. With with everything in it. And just to sort of show, show you the create repository screen, uh, we have the name of uh, friendly label type. Is, we just currently have puppet and yum. And I'm, I'm going to talk about the puppet part next. A URL and then whether you want to publish it via HTTP which uh, Red Hat content is the only content that's not published via HTTP just because it is tied to the subscription and whatnot. So next I've, I've got a Puppet product here. And I forgot to mention a uh, product is just sort of a collection of repositories, groups, sort of however you'd like. I've got a CentOS 6 product, so you might have a 64-bit and a 32-bit version there. Um, and here I've just got a little Puppet project product and this first repository, I've actually synced Puppet Forge. So if we just click on it, the URL that I typed in was actually just forge.puppetlabs.com. Um, it hit sync, and we've got all 2,000 packages in it. And generally, this probably isn't too useful, um, but if you say search for public modules with uh, so we can see that we currently have 11 uh, patchy public modules and it's, it's there by author and that that will sort of become important in a moment so in addition to syncing Puppet Forge, we can also upload Puppet modules either through the 
Hammer CLI, um, as Bill had mentioned, Hammer's pluggable. Tell uses Hammer extensively. So the amount of actions you can perform with Hammer goes up by like 60% or something when you use self -control. So I can just come here and also upload it through the web UI. Um, where are the channels? So I'll just search for Apache real quick. So initially I just see Apache and so I'll say select a version. And I, I have a few choices here. You know, I, I can pick per author. So if we go down, we'll want the public labs one. We can say use this specific version, 101. Uh, and, you know, if, if I knew that that was the version I wanted, I would pick that. Most likely what you're going to do is just say use the latest. So every time I publish this content view, 
it's always going to pull the latest Puppet Labs Apache module out of the lab. <coughs> And that'll get updates from or you know, you're saying, you schedule. Yes, or if you're pushing uh, public modules directly either via the web UI or through Hammer, you know, new versions will appear in library. Also, there is a feature where you can sync from a Git repository. So if you have a Git repository with all of your public modules, you, know, you can sync every night from a particular branch from that repository. So now I'll go ahead and publish a new version. And this will take a couple minutes. And so what this is do is basically creating sim links on the file system and cloning all that content. So this is going to create version one we see here. And this will, version one will always be the same forever in the end of time. It will never change. So you know, a year from now, if you've decided to keep this version around, you can come back and re-promote this to a lifecycle environment be able to use it just as it was today. It's, again, it's also promoting um, or copying sort of symlinking the puppet modules and the uh, packages with RPMs. And in addition to creating that, that archive that sticks around, it's promoting it to the library lifecycle environment. So we'll see, yeah, as you can see here. Are there any questions while this is running? Um, <clears throat> is that the case even though you uh, pick the latest and not a specific version? It'll, still... It'll pick the latest every time I publish. So if at tonight at midnight it synced again and pulled in a new version and I promoted it tomorrow morning, it would pull the latest. Right, so it wouldn't be the same version a year from now. So this version 1 will stick around forever until I believe it. <coughs> So if I were to publish a new version in a year, so it'd be version 100, let's say, <laughs> then that would have the very latest version. But version 1 will always have 101, or, or whatever it was. Now, the whole idea is to take your RPM, the packages, plus your public manifest, and you know both of them work, like your CentOS, your custom repositories, whatever, all the stuff that needs to build your system, Put it in one box, and now talk about those boxes that you can deploy now or next year. In terms of versioning, can you do a similar thing with uh, RPMs? So, like, you have a, I built a system a year ago, and then so now I've tested that, and so I don't want to bring the latest packages in. I want to put the exact same packages from before or something along those lines. Yes. So <laughs> I think uh, the question was sort of. Does it also, can I, can I customize particular versions, lock things down to a particular version, such that I can still access it a year later? Um, so just similar to Puppet modules, the version's locked with the RPM content. If we want to customize what RPM content actually goes into that snapshot, or that version, make those successes. Uh, I can create a filter here, and there's a variety of filter types so for example, I could exclude Emacs. Any, any package that starts with Emacs or explicitly is Emacs, I could exclude, um, how does she do that? And you can lock to a version too. Yep, you can lock to a range of versions. You can say I don't want anything after or before a particular version. So I could say, let's say, So this here would exclude all, all versions of the Emacs package. Uh, and then here, for example, I could say, you know, I only I want to exclude only between these two versions. So it gives you <coughs> sort of fine-grained control. The, the errata filter, especially with Red Hat content, is really valuable because you could publish a new version of a view and just say, I want just this one new errata. And so, you know, I, I only want this one bug fix, basically. And actually, I'll just go ahead and save this, and it will republish. And while I'm talking about other things, so it's just keeping everything in the same Postgres database. This form of Postgres database. It is. As a plugin, it's it's using the Active Record and Rails exactly the same. So yes, talking the same database. Pulp does use a Mongo database, 
and Candlepin uses a different database in Postgres running on the same instance of Postgres. So we well, we've talked about this before in, in 1.4 the sync time is extremely long. What have you done to improve that in 1.5 or this might be that you're right now? How long would it take to sync the entire CentOS people right now roughly? Um, I mean, so it does obviously depend greatly on your bandwidth, but they've yeah. made a good deal of improvements on the import. I'm sorry, not sync, uh, publish. Oh, publish, publish or yeah. promoter, yeah. yeah. So you saw here I published um, all of CentOS 6, 6,000 packages in, what's that, two and, and a half minutes? minutes? Yeah, okay, so, so not 20, 30. Exactly. 20 minutes we minutes. spent a great deal of time on that because that was a common complaint. We yeah. hated it. Users yeah. hated it. Uh, so I just, well, I'll let you talk. Hit publish again. And so we should see Emacs be excluded, although actually I think correctly just fixed the bug. So, so was it a bug or was it uh, the improvement that you've done? Was it a feature or a bug? Uh, you mean the... Yeah, yeah, there we go. The speed improvements, it was, since Pulp was a separate service, you know, they, they may tell us to do something one way, and we do it that way, but it's not necessarily optimized to our workload. Um, the, the move to Dynflow as the orchestration engine helped a lot because we could paralyze things. Pulp 2.3's tasking system was atrocious, and they actually have a really nice tasking system now. So it can do things in parallel where it couldn't before. So if you're promoting two very large repos, that clone operation actually happens truly in parallel across two different processors and processes, whereas before it didn't. So we'll, we'll ignore that. That was a, a little bug that actually was just fixed today. Uh, okay, so, so we've published this content view. Let's go over sort of the format. Uh, when you install Catello, out of the box, it configures a smart proxy by default. And you get a puppet and a puppet CA. And so we've, we've got this smart proxy here. You can add additional smart proxies, just like you can with Foreman. But you can add, add a pulp node, which allows you to synchronize content to your capsule. Or, sorry, smart proxy. I may say capsule through this demo. I mean smart proxy. Uh, and so the idea being you have the smart proxy in your capsule controlling your, your Pixie server, your DCP server, your DNS server. You don't want to put the content there. So all your systems will be going to your, to your smart proxy or its content instead of going all the way back to the foreign server. And also your puppet pockets are there. So if we go to our puppet environments, we can see the New York, New York City view right here is a puppet environment that got created. And ignore the terrible names, um, that's one of the integration points that we haven't made as friendly as a lot of the other things. So we have this content view or sorry, we have this puppet environment. If we click on classes, we can actually see all those Apache classes from that module. So we've, we've uploaded an Apache module, we've published it in a content view, it gets pushed to the puppet master. And let me show you that actually on the file system. So here we go. So you're here on the file system, and this one is running on the same same box. But again, if you had a smart proxy with a pulp node in your remote data center, it would show up there as well. And then Foreman has imported these back into itself, basically. Um, and we can, if we go to a a new host, and we can select that lifecycle environment. So we'll select uh, a great friend and the content view, and then, so that's automatically using that puppet environment. So we don't have to sort of think about it, it's just using that puppet environment. And if we go over to public classes, we see there's our, our patching. And we can add that host just as dominant to it. Well, okay. So 
So it's really about sort of integrating everything from, you know, you have your puppet model, module, it's ready for, for more serious testing. You push it to Catello along with the content, and it creates this snapshot, which gets deployed out to all the smart proxies and shows up really throughout the entire app. Are there any questions? So in the case of the incremental errata, right? So does just the errata get saved, or does the entire content get duplicated and so on? Uh, on sync. So uh, the question. Right? Yeah. Oh, published, right? Yeah. So the question was, if a new errata gets uh, released, is the actual content, the RPM content, of that errata duplicated? So um, Hope uses symlinking on the file system. So when you sync an RPM from CentOS or Red Hat or, or anywhere, and then you, you make views, you know, you make you may make 20 different versions or 20 different views or whatnot. Uh, it's that package is only on the file system once. So uh, it, the the footprint is much smaller than if you were just trying to manage your own repositories on your own without a lot of scripting. Okay. Yeah. Back. What do you recommend for people that run Foreman and Catello separate separate services? Uh, so right now you do if you're running Foreman and you want to use Catello, you need to set up a new server. New Catello server? A new Foreman server. Oh yeah. Uh, there's no upgrade path from a standalone Foreman server to one with Catello. So there's no plugin I can install from Catello plugin. There is a plugin. I wouldn't recommend you install it. Okay. But. Uh, there's, there's not yet. I'm not, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. yeah, I was just about to say that. That is okay. something we want to do. It's just not something that we've had at the time. Um, what about existing form and configuration? Can that be then imported later, later on? Or? Same thing. I mean, we want to do it. Yeah. I guess it depends on what type of configuration you're talking about. In theory, and we haven't been doing a lot of testing, in theory, there's no problem with like the Catella installer, which is the formal installer plus plus. And you know, import your database and run the installer, and you know, add. it it should work. We're still in you know development cycle where um, we want to get the software running and then go back to the upgrade path so you have to consume it. But the part of the reason that you're unable to do that is because Paul and Ken have a lot of SSL configuration that is not trivial at all to configure. So uh, the Catello installer, which is, is very similar to the form installer, just has some extra modules, does a lot of that heavy lifting for you. Okay. For my, uh, my roadmap, do I need to be putting in retired space logs in place with Catello, or is that not on the same path? Our, our goal is to provide the functionalities of Spacewalk, so all the content management, um, raw management. We, uh, there are, at some point, they're just going to be the same project, right? Or at least they're going to have the same functionality. Yeah. Red Hat, as a company, has chosen to use Catello and Foreman for the next version of satellite, of Red Hat right. satellite. So the, the contributions to Spacewalk will slowly trickle out. In terms of installing packages, is all the package installation, is there, is there a Catello agent, or is that all the yeah, there is a Catello agent. Uh, it, it's what allows us to actually calculate a RADA applicability, if you're familiar. Does anyone need me to explain what RADA are? Okay. Uh, it's fine. And it allows us to, to calculate a RADA cap capability. It allows us to, we actually just added, so if you, if you install a new package, it immediately shows up in its package profile that that package is, is now there. Um, it allows us to do remote actions, like package installations, or RADA app. Installations, package removal, and package updating. Uh, it's we've talked a lot about M Collective, and those actions will probably be moved to the M Collective if we ever get there. You know how Spacewalk uses uh, proxies. Yes. Um, so for just a lot of clients, so the same thing. So the smart proxy is designed to replace the proxy with a lot more capabilities. Uh, right now, you know, you, like like they said, you have the DNS, the HTTP, the TFTP, and the, the pull node gives us the content. 
So it's, it is unlike the, the spacewalk proxy in that it's not a caching proxy. It, it actively syncs the content. It pushes it to the proxy as soon as it's available, basically. And the proxy is a separate system yeah. or same host? Uh, so, so by default, we install. Let me go back. By default, we install a smart proxy on the same system, just providing uh, Puppet and Puppet CA functionality. We, it doesn't have a pulp node because you're running pulp on it already. So when you install a smart proxy on a separate system with a pulp node, you, you have that content mirroring capability as well. I guess I was kind of wondering about scaling. Th that's, that's sort of how it scales is by, you, you put the smart proxy in your data center or, or just break it up, you may have, if you have enough systems, you may have multiple smart proxies in your data center to serve content. Yeah, no, the clients will get all their content from the smart proxy, not, they won't even touch the... Right, the, so right, right now, uh, we've got a couple of, of open issues that don't go to full, full parity, like it doesn't kickstart from the smart proxy, that should be fixed very soon. It doesn't route all requests through through the proxy, like registrate, like uh, subscription manager registration, similar to RHM reg or RHM register. Uh, it doesn't route all communication. It's about ninety percent of communication, and our goal is to get to a hundred percent. Did I understand you right that it's actively pushing the results of a new sync to the proxy, so that means if I have that's a good question. So it, it sort of depends on which environments you choose to sync. So let me go to, actually I can't show that. Uh, but because uh, we're working on a UI for this feature that I'm talking about. But those lifecycle environments, you can actually align to a smart proxy. And that selects which environments get pushed down. So you mainly have one repo, but it may sync the subset of repos that it's there to serve. Exactly. Yeah. So you may want only production push down to a smart proxy. But in reality, it may be about the same size. So yeah. It just okay. depending. All right. I'm being told to wrap it up. Um, is there anything else? Okay. All right.